Hello everyone, my name is Vlad, I'm from the University of Waterloo, and I'll be joining the University of Alberta in fall of 2021. Today I'll be talking to you about the effect of Q-function reuse on the total regret of tabular, model-free reinforcement learning. This is a joint work with Sriram from the University of Waterloo and Matthew Taylor from the University of Alberta. The agenda for the talk looks as follows. We'll begin by discussing the motivation for the work, then we'll discuss the main results, afterwards We'll talk about the experiments performed, and finally, we'll conclude with future work. This is transfer learning and reinforcement learning at a really high level. So here's the example. You want to learn the bike. So you start with putting on training wheels on your bike. You learn with training wheels, and then after you feel ready, you transfer your skills to the full bike, but you take off the training wheels. And so therefore, you're transferring, you're tran you're transferring your skills that you've learned with the training wheels to the regular bike. There's all sorts of methods to do this. Some that I mentioned here are lifelong learning, imitation learning, human advice, reward shaping, value function transfer, and there's many others that I certainly did not mention here. In this work, we focus on value function transfer, and specifically, we call it Q-function reuse, since the Q-function is a value function. So what is Q-function reuse? Um, as you can see here with the asterisks, recall, first of all, that Q-function reuse, like I said, is the state action value function. So that's why it's value function transfer. And so what Q-function reuse is doing is it's, it's basically the process of training an agent on a simple source task, and then you're trying to transfer the information it learned, which is the Q-function it actually learned on that source task, to a more complex target task. And this process usually looks like this three-step process here. So we start with some algorithm X, and we learn some Q-function QS on our source task. Afterwards, we initialize algorithm X with Q of S on our more complex target task. And then we use that initialized algorithm to learn a Q function in the target task called Q of T. So I'm going to go over a more uh, concrete example so you guys understand exactly what I mean by Q function use since it's critical for the rest of the presentation. So let's begin. On the bottom left here, there's a very simple environment. There's six states from X1 to X6. And all the states, you receive a reward of 0 except for state 1. You receive a reward of 1 for transitioning into state 1. So how does the process look like for Q function use? Well, the first step is you learn a Q function in this source environment. So these are these Q of S's that you can see in each of these states here. And so after you've learned this good enough Q function in the source task, then transfer it, which is step 2, to your target task, which is essentially initializing all the states in your target task that are the same as your source task to the Q function you've learned. Your hope is that the Q function is similar enough, similar enough from the source task to the target task that it can be useful in the target task. Finally, in step three, you use algorithm X to learn in environment M of T or in the target task, and there you finally learn your Q function Q of T. And basically the hope is that this process will speed up learning as opposed to just learning in the target task from scratch. I'm going to quickly go over some of the literature on Q function reuse. So maybe some of the oldest results is from 1985 by Selfridge. And here they, they train a pull balancing task with progressively more challenging tasks where the pull gets longer and longer. And between each of these tasks they're transferring a value function. Similarly, in this work by Asada in 1994, they're transferring value functions across larger and larger grid worlds. In this work, it's a slightly different flavor of Q-function reuse, but it still follows the same general steps. Um, they're basically training a robot from human demonstration, so a human trains the robot. And while the human is in control of the robot, the, lo the robot is using that those actions that the human is taking to basically learn a Q function. Then the human stops training the robot and that Q function that it's learned is then used as the initialization for the robot to start learning on its own. Some work from 2007 by Taylor et al. is um, this work here in which they learn how to, they, they basically have these robot soccer tasks and the tasks get more challenging and they transfer value functions between these tasks. And this is done in simulation. And then in 2010, Barrett et al. with Matt Taylor as well, they worked on showing that this actually works with physical robots. 
critical thing to note is that all these results show that they work, but through empirical experiments. And so this comes to what the point of this whole talk really is. And that is, can we provide theoretical results for Q function reuse? More precisely, can we theoretically guarantee that Q function reuse will provide better learning under certain assumptions? Next, we'll discuss the main results of our work. We'll begin by describing the algorithm we chose. What we mean by algorithm is if you recall in the three-step process for Q function reuse, there was an algorithm X, which we used for Q function evaluation. The algorithm we choose is the Q learning with upper confidence bound Hofting for this step. The reason for this choice is that if you recall, the Q function empirical results were mainly focused on model-free online learning algorithms. Also, tabular value functions make theoretical analysis simpler. Therefore, we went with a state-of-the-art in tabular model-free online algorithms, which was the Q-learning with upper confidence bound Hofting algorithm, presented by Jin et al. So this is the algorithm, and I'm going to briefly just discuss it here. So the algorithm deals with finite horizons, where the finite horizon is H, and the number of episodes is capital K. So the algorithm goes as follows. We begin by initializing, and, and one thing I want to note is this algorithm, as you can tell from the name, is Q learning with upper confidence bounds, and so it's going to be very similar to the regular Q learning algorithm. So we begin by initializing your Q function to H for all states and actions, and this is essentially the, the most value you could ever receive at any state and action, so it's an optimistic initialization. And then we initialize this value called N, and it's essentially a counter of how many times we visited each state and action. Therefore, at the beginning, it's zero. Afterwards, we loop over all the episodes k, little k, up to capital K, which is the number of episodes we've predefined for this algorithm. And then we loop over, um, we loop over the steps from 1 to capital H, where H is the horizon. In each one of these loops, we take an action, which is the greedy action based on our Q function, just like in Q learning, and then we observe the next state. The next step is different from the regular Q-learning algorithm. And what's different is that now we update our counter, or n, for the number of times we visited each state in action. And we update a bonus term, which if you look, there's in the denominators the little t, which is equal to the n term. And essentially, as you visit a state in action more and more, you get more and more confident, and your bonus decreases. This essentially encourages exploration at states and actions when you have very little confidence in them. In step seven, you can see this is almost the Q-learning update, except there's a little bonus term near the end here, which is different from the regular Q-learning update, and this is encouraging exploration for states and actions that we have little confidence in. Finally, we truncate the value to make sure that it does not surpass the maximum possible value at any state, which is H. Okay. So one thing I want to highlight is that Q function reuse can actually be thought of as Q function initialization in a specific way. So if we recall, these are the three steps of the Q function reuse. And the second step specifically, you're initializing your algorithm with Q of S, which is a Q function you've learned from your source task. So if we just assume that we're handed some sort of Q function from our source task, then steps two and three are just a question of how well does algorithm X perform if we have some initialization Q of S. Also, I want to highlight that algorithm X is the Q learning with upper confidence bound Hofting algorithm that we just discussed earlier. And so in our work, we focus on just steps two and three. So we assume that we're given some initialization Q of S. And this initialization, I'll discuss the assumptions we make on this initialization. And then based on that, how well do we do on steps two and three? So does some initialization based on our assumptions help with learning? So this is the question of interest that we're trying to answer in our work, and I can precisely state it now. The question is, will the total regret of the Q-learning with upper confidence bound Hofning algorithm be lower in a complex target MDP MFT if it's initialized with some pre-trained Q function from a related but simpler MDP M of S? Okay, so now I'm gonna go over our algorithm and essentially the assumptions we make. So recall that we're handed some source Q function. So some Q function we've learned from some source, and here I'm going to discuss the assumptions we make on that. 
So the first point here discusses those assumptions. The assumptions we make is that the Q function we're handed is optimal for all states, all actions, and all steps except for one state, x of 1, all, one action, which is a of 1, and one step, which is h equal to 1. So this is a pretty restricted assumption. However, we think it's a good first step to see how this algorithm will behave. So in math, you can see that this is how it would look. And essentially, in words, what happens is every single state, action, and step we assume is the optimal Q function, and we assume we only need to really learn one state, action, and step. The second assumption we make is that since we have knowledge that all states and actions and steps other than one is optimal, we therefore don't update the Q function for any of those other states and actions and steps because we know that they're optimal and we don't want to essentially update them to a suboptimal value. So we make the restriction that we only update the Q function for the state x1, the action a1, and the step h equal to 1. Once again, a rather restrictive assumption. This is the algorithm, and as you can see, it looks very similar to the Q learning with upper confidence bound hopping. It's essentially the same thing, except with a few assumptions added. You can see the first two lines are the assumptions on the initialization, which is that we're initializing the Q function to the optimal Q function for all states, actions, and steps except for one. And then there's this if statement, which essentially just makes sure that we're updating the Q function only when, we visit, when we're visiting the state x1, the action a1, and we're at step h equal to 1, which is the first step. And now we can move on to the main theorem. In the main theorem, we measure performance based on a metric called regret. We chose to use regret because it's commonly used in the theoretical literature and it's also used in the main paper by Jin et al. The main idea behind regret is that you're trying to compare your agent's performance or its policy, which is this policy here, based on the optimal policy, which is the star here. You're basically trying to compare the value you would get under your policy that your agent is following compared to the optimal policy. And this is compared over all episodes, capital K. And this is the main theorem of our paper. So the, the, the thing to really highlight is that the regret that we got with this initialization is this big O of the square root of h to the power of 2 times t, where t is essentially the, the, the total number of steps that the agent or the learner takes throughout all its learning. So it's the horizon, which is h, times k, which is the number of episodes. The theorem presented by Jin et al for their Q-learning with upper confidence bound Hoffning algorithm is this big O of square root of h to the power of 4 times the cardinality of the states times the cardinality of the actions times t times iota. So the thing to really highlight is that our results are tighter by a factor of big O of square root of s, a, and h squared factor. So due to time constraints, I don't actually go over the, the proof in this talk. However, I do want to highlight some of the, the high level reasons why this might intuitively make sense. So recall from our initialization that all states, actions, and steps are optimal except for one. So it makes sense that we don't have the factor of s and the factor of a. Similarly, it makes sense that we'd lose one factor of h. Now the fact that we lost two factors of h or h to the power of 2 makes sense because the second factor actually comes from the fact that since our assumption is that the first step or h equal to 1 is the state or is the q value that is optimal that means we don't actually have to roll out the error through time or through steps like you would originally in the algorithm therefore if h was probably some other value like the second step or the third step this one of the h factors might be reintroduced now we'll go over the experiments so first i'm going to discuss the experimental setup so the setup looks as follows so the top left is the environment so three states, and the reward is a zero in all states except for the rightmost state, which is x3. That means when the agent transitions into the rightmost state, x3, it receives a reward of one. There's two actions, a1 and a2, which are left and right respectively. And the optimal policy is intuitively just to go right in all the states for all the steps. And this makes intuitive sense because you just want to get to the rightmost state. Okay. So the horizon we choose is 3 for this um, experiment, and we assume that all the actions are deterministic. 
or the transitions are all deterministic in the sense that if you go left, you take action A1, you will end up in one state to the left with probability one and the same thing for ta taking action A2. Finally, the way we initialize the opt the way we initialize or the initialization we use here is that the Q function is optimal for all states and actions and steps except for state X1, action A1, and step H equal to one. So what does that correspond to? That corresponds to this leftmost state here. It corresponds to the left action, which is just running into the wall and staying in the same state. And it corresponds to the first step. So note that the optimal action here is going right. Also recall that in the algorithm, we initialize this state, or we initialize the state action and step to an optimistic value of h. So what we would expect to see is that the learner will eventually learn that the action going to the left is not as good and start taking the right action. I just wanted to bring up the assumptions that we made in the algorithm just for the sake of notation. So recall there's these two assumptions. We're going to call the second assumption assumption 2 or a2. And this is important because the three algorithms we test in the experiments are as follows. The first one is just the original Q learning with upper confidence bound Hofting algorithm presented by Jin et al. The second one is going to be our algorithm, but without A2. So that's without the second assumption, which is without updating, without the assumption that we don't update the optimal Q functions. And then the third algorithm is just the algorithm we spoke about. So just to be a little more concrete, the first algorithm is the one we talked about first. It's the, the original UCB Hofting algorithm. The second one is our algorithm, but essentially without this if statement. So the update occurs for all states, actions, and steps. There's no restriction here. And the reason for doing this is, is we want to just show experimentally that this is, this is a valuable step. This is crucial to the regret we got, because otherwise, if this if statement was not here, and we did not res restrict the update only to the non-optimal state, action, and step, then we could possibly update the optimal Q functions to values that are not correct, and it would cause a learning to take longer. Then the third algorithm is, is simply our algorithm, which we have shown that the regret should be much lower. So in the experiment, the metric we use is a per episode of regret. And if you look at the original regret, we can see that the per episode regret is essentially, as the name says, it's gonna be the regret for each episode or little k. And so the total regret can just be written as the sum of all the per episodes regret of, of, of the per episode regret over all episodes. And so these are the results we got. So we can see here in green is our algorithm. And we can see that the vertical axis is the regret. So this is the per episode regret on the vertical axis. So a smaller regret is good and a larger regret is bad. So this means that our algorithm in green seems to be performing the best. It essentially goes from it essentially goes to a regret of zero, the, the quickest, and it starts from a regret, which is lower than all the others. We can see that the algorithm in blue, which is the original algorithm, which has no initialization assumptions, starts off with the largest regret and has a large regret for the first 50 or so episodes. We can see in orange is our algorithm, but without the assumption two. What's interesting is that, all, like, is that we have an initialization that is optimal for all states, actions, and steps, except for one, which you would think would perform quite well, but we see this interesting intersection at about episode 50, where it actually ha starts has a worse per episode regret than the original algorithm, but it actually reaches a per episode regret of zero earlier than the original algorithm, which seems to be fluctuating above zero, slightly above zero for quite a lot of episodes and never quite converging. We'd also like to mention these results were averaged at over 50 independent trials, and the shaded area represents a 95% confidence interval. Finally, we'll wrap this talk up by talking about future directions. We think there's three distinct directions that we can take this work into the future. The first would be to increase the number of non-optimal Q values. So recall in our algorithm, we assumed that only one state, which was X1, one action, which was A1, in one step, which was h equal to one, had a non-optimal Q value. So a natural direction is to increase the number of non-optimal Q values. 
and we might do this by increasing this to more actions or increasing this over a large number a larger number of states or over more steps while keeping the other two variables constant the second direction is inspired by noting that naturally when you're doing q function reuse the q function that you're obtaining from the source that you would be using for the initialization in the target task is not going to be the optimal q function this stems from the fact that most algorithms such as q learning will only converge to the optimal q function in the case of infinite samples. Thus, we usually have Q functions that are near optimal, but not quite optimal. Introducing a near optimal assumption instead of an optimal assumption would make this work more practical. An example of this would be to make our Q function some epsilon away from the optimal Q function for all states and actions instead of exactly optimal. The final direction is allowing the Q function to be updated at all states, actions, and steps. And this is actually exactly what we did in our experimental section where we removed assumption 2. We saw that the performance of our algorithm actually decreased. And this made sense because now the Q function was being updated or the optimal Q function was being updated and possibly becoming subopt. However, this is a natural assumption we'd want to make because normally when you're transferring a Q function from a source task, you don't always know which states, actions, and steps the Q function was optimal for your new target task. So what you'd like is a general algorithm that does not have a restriction such as assumption 2. To conclude, we'd like to summarize the main contributions of this work. Firstly, we provided theoretical results showing that Q function reuse when applied with the Q learning with upper confidence bound Hofting algorithm will indeed reduce the total regret. Secondly, we provided empirical results in a simple environment to confirm that our theoretical results are true. We aren't aware of other theoretical work for transfer learning and reinforcement learning. If any of you know of such work, we'd be interested to hear about it. Thank you everyone, this concludes the talk.